This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to episode 227 of Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now. And absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. You can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, you can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to a geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's a geekleader.com slash A2. All right, geek leaders. Today on the show, I have Kevin Manny, and he's a best-selling author and the founder of a group called Category Design Advisors. And he's the author of a book that we're going to be talking about called Play Bigger. Uh, and, and Kevin has written a lot of cool stuff, uh, including Unscaled, which is about AI. Um, and I definitely want to talk about that a little bit too. But Play Bigger really is sitting on my desk right here. And it struck me because it talks about innovations and becoming a category king, which I definitely want to talk about. Um, we'll get into that in just a minute. So Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. If you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about kind of your background and how you got to where you are today and what drove you to um, research and write about um, this book called Play Bigger. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, I have been a journalist for uh, three decades, uh, all of it covering technology and, and writing about the tech industry and the tech's impact on business and society um, with pretty much like every publication you could think of and also commentator on TV and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and as, as part of that, I started writing books and I've written a whole bunch of books and um, uh, one of those books came out five years ago and it's called play bigger, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, I wrote it with three other guys, Silicon Valley guys who had been, you know, CEOs and company founders and had turned into startup advisors. They had some interesting ideas about, um, how, you know, startups should think about strategy and, um, in this new sort of, you know, digital, you know, world and, you know, where every industry is digital. And, um, I thought, you know, I mean, I thought I was a, still a journalist and an author and I was going to write play bigger and just keep writing books. And, and that was be my job, which actually, by the way, I still have been doing it. I just literally finished another book last week. Um, but um, uh, but the play bigger book may, may created something of a left turn in that um, once they mm -hmm. came out, we started getting like just, you know, startup founders, um, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists. Uh, getting in touch with us and saying, um, you know, please help, you know, help us do what you wrote about in the book. And um, so this has turned into a whole different trajectory where I'm now advising dozens of startups a year and and working with them through workshops to try to help them figure out, um, as we call it, their category design strategy. And uh, and it's been like a whole new universe for me, which has been fantastic, actually a really interesting turn for me. Awesome. Awesome. And um, one of the things that, you know, I, I like to when I started reading the book is you do use a lot of tech examples and, you know, um, about being a category king. It, what, what exactly is a category king? Uh, well, it, a, a category king is it, um, you know, as, as probably many of your listeners realize is that the way digital markets work uh, mm -hmm. it, it is that uh, it's pretty much a winner take all business in almost any particular category. Um, because unlike, you know, in the old physical world where if there was a, you know, store on the corner, it could be the best store in town, but the next town over couldn't get to it. So, you know, the wealth got spread around. Um, in, the, in the digital universe, everybody in the world can get the best mm -hmm. uh, or what is perceived as the best. And so everybody does that. And, and you end up in market after market with, you know, you think of something like, you know, Uber and Lyft and everybody else, you know, eating a few scraps from that um, on-demand transportation market is uh, you almost always get one company taking 
70 percent plus of the market share and economics out of that business and, and somebody else with another 20 percent and a few others scrapping for the scraps right <laughs> and so uh, part of the point is that if that's the way the world works now if you're starting a company why wouldn't you want to have the aim from the very beginning of being the category king um, makes complete sense because and and if you're if you're entering somebody else's category that's kind of a losing strategy from the beginning because somebody else is already the category king and they already are owning 70 percent of the economics and it's really hard to unseat them and so you're just going to end up fighting for some market share and, and having a tough time of it so that's kind of the basic reasoning for why we even thought you know this book and this topic was interesting yeah. Yeah. So you talk about like, you know, creating your own category, creating something new that's out there. It's so I'm going to use myself as an example because that's just what I do. <laughs> it makes it a little bit easier for me to my brain to work about things. So um, I, I, let's say I'm in a business and our industry has been around for a long time and we're a middle of the road player for what we typically do. Mm -hmm. And we want to become, we want to create a category out of our product or service that we already have. That's, you know, like I said, we're, we're doing all right. We're profitable. We're, we're not, you know, we're, we're not a category king, you know, like a Facebook or something like that. How would we define a new category? And is it all about just segmenting the market? Is it about um, being innovative in your product or in your message or a little bit of all that? Well, all it's all... It it's it's some of that and and, and none of some of that um <laughs> it's uh so the first question we start with is um uh, is is what problem is there to solve and um and if you if you can solve a um an old problem that people have had but don't have a satisfactory solution to that mm -hmm. or 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 uh, understand that there's a new problem arising in the world that you can solve and nobody is solving yet uh, that that essentially is a category. An unsolved problem is a new category. Gotcha. Um, and let me let me tell you um, and your and your listeners. Sometimes the easiest way to, to almost like what you just did, right? Is sometimes the easiest way to describe this is by telling a, a quick story. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go way back in time because this is not this is not you know it, it, newly invented stuff. I'm going to go back to the story of Chrysler in the 1980s. So. Um, <clears throat> Chrysler was going bankrupt in the 1980s, and uh, and one of the reasons is there's all these you know flood of cars from Japan, Toyota, Nissan, and all these other companies that are much better quality, and um, and so you know Chrysler was looking around at the bar. There's there is no way that it could say we're going to put out a new car and say that it's better than a Toyota, and people are going to believe us. Um, we can't compete in those in those existing spaces. But what Chrysler uh, its executives uh, noticed about the world was that um, there was something interesting happening. Baby boomers were moving out to the suburbs um, and and having two or three kids, mm -hmm. and um, and they and they when they did um, they were buying either a station wagon or just kind of a large sedan, which is you know not quite big enough, or the other choice they'd have would be to buy like a big old van that drove like a truck and didn't fit in the you know in the uh, garage because it was too tall and so they recognized that there was kind of an unsolved problem out there of families um, needing something bigger to haul around kids and take them to soccer practice and do carpools um, and, and yet drive like uh, you know a, a car and, and fit in the garage and you know look nice and and there wasn't anything like that out there so they they invented the category of the minivan, um, and what's important about this story is is they they told the they didn't just go out and say like we we have the, we built this you know Dodge Caravan and here's the features and you know here's what it is. They went out and they 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 opened up this this space in people's minds about like oh my, you know made people understand oh you're right like I wish there was a car uh, or a vehicle that solved this problem for me better than what's out there today. Mm -hmm. And and suddenly now you have people's attention because you've defined a problem that they go, oh, yeah, actually I do have that problem and, and nobody's solving it for me. And then Chrysler said, and you know, now that we've opened up that sort of space in your head that this, this exists and there's no solution for it, we're going to tell you that we've invented the solution. It's these Two models of you know cars and uh, and the so the 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 category the space is minivan. We have these brands, the 
you know, Plymouth and Dodge uh, Caravan, Plymouth Voyager to, to solve that problem. So if, if you take that story forward and you think of anything, you know, you look at, look at um, the market space. If, if you're a company like you just described, you've been around for a while, you, you obviously know a lot about um, a particular range of market spaces. And, 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 and the trick is to look up and say, you know, where's that unsolved problem? Where's that new space in people's minds that we can open up like Chrysler did with a minivan and create a, something that, that feels entirely new and different. And so you're not competing against, you're not saying we're better than this one or we're, we got more, we're faster. We got five more knobs than this other one. Um, it's, uh, it's about creating something that feels completely different and, and we're going to, um, be the one that's going to create the solution for that space we just defined. So that's, that's kind of the basic idea behind this idea of category design. Hmm. So do you see this as um, <clears throat> like, I guess when I think about, you know, um, designing a new category and coming up with something like that, it requires a lot of creative thinking and a lot of innovation. And um, is that one of the areas that that you really focus on when you're when you're going, let's say you're going into a company that's struggling and, um, you know, they want to become a category king, but they're not there yet. They're not sure exactly what to do. And you're going to go through this process of, of finding out what the problem they're trying to solve is. And, and, and then is it really an innovative uh, process after that, that you get into creative thinking, you get into market research, or or is it more is it more than that? Um, well, uh, first of all, there's we go into these situations with companies believing that the company <clears throat> has um, a tremendous amount of knowledge about what the space out the spaces out there, and, and that we need to pull it out of them. Mm -hmm. um, rather than being like a uh, McKinsey and we're going to go do a ton of research and come in and tell you what to do. Okay. Um, and, and so we like, you know, when we work with a company, the first day we work with a company, we, we schedule like a six hour workshop. Um, and, and we want the, um, the leadership team around the table, six, eight, 10 people. And, and it had, and it should be the, you know, the C, the CEO, C, um, CMO, C, FO, but also the head of product and the head of sales, um, the head of HR. Um, sometimes, depending on the company, maybe it's the it's the chief uh, counsel. Um, we we want those people around the table. And the first con the, the first conversation we open with literally is what I said before: is what what's the problem? What problem do you solve? Or what problem do you see that we can solve? Strangely, not that that simple question ends up being a six hour debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and the um, and and that actually trying to see the space first is what drives everything that happens after. Because if you see, I mean, if if you see the space, if, if we end up out of that room, um, understanding that there is an unsolved problem that um, and the solution to this thing must exist. And whether this company that we're sitting there with at this moment in time does it or not, somebody's gonna do it because we just identified a, a universal truth that this thing is out there and needs to be solved. Um, and, and if that's so, then, then that is a market opportunity. That is a space that you, know, you, could, you could actually own. Um, and by the end of this um, whole category design process, what we're actually doing is helping a company see what that space is and, and, and we'll actually write like a 800,000 word um, kind of narrative document that describes mm -hmm. what this problem is and how the solution is going to work in a very straightforward language. And, um, and, and then once everybody around the table realizes that that's the business that we're in, that's the problem we need to solve. Um, th these are the reasons it's not being solved now and, and what the features of a, of a product that solves it would look like. That document should contain all of that. At that point in time, the guy who's the head of product is going to go back to his engineering team and say, this is the flag on the hill. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, when, when uh, you get, you know, don't get distracted by, you know, say what some other customer says they want, you know, two new features on the product that we're already building. Actually, it's time to say no, because we see the flag that we're going to go towards and the product team is going to start trying to build a product to solve that problem. The, um, the marketing team is going to start to try to create language um, that defines 
um, that space so that people understand what it is and, and, and tells the world that you know, we're the ones that are going to fill that space. The HR team is going to go and say, you know what, we need a certain kind of people in the company to, um, to create the, uh, the, you know, the solution that we're, um, we're going after. So it might alter a little bit of the mix of kind of people we hire. You know, the sales deck, the CEO has got to alter the, the, um, the, the investment deck so that it actually addresses that problem um, and goes and, and helping, you know, investors understand where they're heading. So it's um, from that core of what's the problem, what's the solution, how does it look, what is this new space, how do we find it, define it, at that point in time, everybody else fans out and does their thing to um to to uh, you know to solve that that particular problem, and that's where that's where the innovation um, and and you know the strategic decisions and the tactics and everything start to come in. Awesome, and that, you know I, I'm just going to say from an outsider, it sounds like this is a lot of fun. And do you find uh, working with companies like at, at this level is more fun than writing books, or or, or vice versa? Uh, anything is more fun than writing books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> writing, I mean, you know, it's been most of my career. There's, I obviously like it this for some reason or other, but it is a form of torture. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, the 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 um, the the work that we do, um, you know, the people that I work with at Category Design Advisors, um, uh, I, you know, thankfully, I mean, I have a partner named Mike uh, who who is um, a former CEO and and uh, a computer scientist. So he brings that kind of set of knowledge to things and, and that way of looking at things when we're sitting in the room. Um, and uh, but for me, my journalist and and author sensibilities are a huge help because it's all about um, asking probing questions. And and um, and really listening for not just the answer, but what's behind the answer, um, and mm-hmm. and then being able to put all of that into words um, in a way that that you know, frankly, you know, most people can't, um, and uh, you know, and, and create a this kind of you know powerful narrative that that tells everybody in the company what they're working for. Um, so it's it has it's well, it's been a a big, you know, leap. If you look at it from the outside, to me, the, the way that I work and the kind of work that I do is um, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of crossover. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. Um, so one of the things I really liked about the book was that you have these little sections that are like the uh, play beer guide to blank, and um, it, and uh, what was the idea behind that? You know, making it real simple with a couple of steps. Um, you know, step one, two, and three on how to do different things, whether it be um, grabbing attention or I'm trying to remember. It's been um, a minute yeah, since like, I looked yeah, at like, it. But, no, like um, yeah, like you know, we yeah we roll, roll through different phases. Like there's you know the mm-hmm. um, uh, you know identifying the category. There's you know creating the POV. There's um, uh, uh, you know rolling it out inside the company. Mm-hmm. There's lo- lo- what we call lightning strikes, which is a way to get. Oh yeah, it how to aim out. lightning? Yeah, something about yeah. <clears throat> um, and uh, so we really wanted to write something useful um, mm-hmm. not just a theoretical book that you know and so the you know the first chapter or so kind of is the big picture of why why we believe this approach is important especially in the way the way that markets work today um, but then it quickly dies into a playbook um, and we wanted it that we wanted we wanted people to be able to um, you know read the book and and do this themselves not not have to call us. Um, I mean, but it's it's been great that they that you know. I mean, we we we. I, I think by having us in the room, it's like a you know, it's a turbo thruster to everything that you know that is in the book. But absolutely, I mean, we get emails all the time from companies that say, you know, we read the book, we did this ourselves. Uh, they they want to they want to show us what they you know they came up with, um, mm-hmm. and uh, um, and it's flattering. I mean, we just companies all over the world have have. Um, you know, use this as a guide to to help them um, understand the market they're after better, and uh, you know, and, and give themselves a, a more solid strategic direction. Awesome, yeah, I think that's a, that's that's really cool. Um, one section of the book was about um, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly, like how how pirates became legendary and. Uh, and and um, made a dent in the universe or something to that effect. Can you talk a little bit about uh, enduring 
um, as, as a category king and, and what people need to do to, uh, to kind of have that kind of impact? Yeah, well, um, and, and this, you know, here's, uh, this is, there's a concept. Um, that, I mean, to, so if you think about an enduring category, first of all, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of a shelf life for any category that, yeah. uh, for the most part. I mean, it, um, and, and so the great companies um, e- either constantly expand the category they're in. You think of some, a company like like Amazon, you know, started out as we're going to do an online bookstore, and then it's we're going to be an online media store, and then it's, mm-hmm. you know, expanding out and expanding out um, over time, and, um, and 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 then there are other companies like um, like Apple, which um, just continually created entirely new categories. The iPhone, you know, the iPhone was a, a new category of product. Um, I mean, there were smartphones before, but um, you know, they defined what a smartphone was or is going to be um and you know and the ipad was a completely new category of product and um so it, you know one, one way or the other you have to build in a culture of category creation and category design and do this over and over and if you want to be you know an enduring long-running generational multi-generational company um there's a concept that um we um uh, we ran across actually after, I, th- I don't think it's in the book, we, uh, but we've, we've since found it to be a powerful thing to discuss with companies and in particular, in fact, technical teams. Um, and it's, we, we stole it from a, um, a book called Where Good Ideas Come From, which is by a guy named Steven Johnson. And actually a really fascinating history of innovation and why certain, um, why certain inventions just caught fire at certain times, like when, to, you know, the automobile, when it did, or the internet, when it, uh, you know, when mm-hmm. the Escape browser came out and all that. Um, so in the, a, a, a core concept in the book is this idea of the adjacent possible. And um, so if you can picture um, kind of a, a, a bubble and, um, and, and inside the bubble is what exists today. It's what's possible, not only what's possible. So, uh, you know, on one hand, there's like what's technically possible, what the, can the technology do satisfactory job of doing? Um, and also what we as humans have been able to, you know, accept and adopt into our lives. And, and so inside that bubble is everything that's here and possible. And, and, and you know, and that can range from the a TV set to a smartphone to, you know, um, anything you can think of that's pretty common today. And by the way, those are all those are all also markets that exist. Like if you entered any of those markets within the in that bubble, you're basically entering somebody else's market, and you're going to you know scratch for market share. Mm-hmm. Outside of the bubble is what's not yet possible; it doesn't yet exist. So the technology is still funky; doesn't really. It's maybe in a lab somewhere. It's still being experimented with. You know, we as as humans can't quite get our heads around you know how this would impact our lives. Um, and, and, uh, you know, somewhere it's like, seems, can seem like science fiction almost. And, and what Stephen points out is that there's, there, there's this band between the possible and the not yet possible, which he calls the adjacent possible. And that's st- that those are area in that area, the technology is just pushed a little beyond, um, the, what its limits had been, but it actually can now do this. Um, and, and we as humans can start to can understand, can see, like we've never seen this before, but now I understand how this could actually be interesting to me. And, um, and all, all the, the world changing inventions, when they hit and, um, and, and made an impact was when they hit that adjacent possible space. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and whoever hit, is that you know the one that brings it to that adjacent possible space is probably the one that's going to own that category. So when um, so a lot of times we'll be talking with a company and they'll have this amazing vision, like they'll they'll out, outline this you know this cool thing that um, that they really want to they they really believe can exist and can change the world, but it's you know it's like ten years out before that could actually happen. And, and so we'll say, okay, well, let's put a pin in that and understand that, that that actually really should exist someday. But if we build a company around that right now today, um, what's going to happen is you're going to be a classic case of one of those companies that has a 
brilliant vision and um, runs out of money before it ever actually catches hold. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take that and start to walk it back um, to a point where it lands in the adjacent possible. And what does that look like? Um, and, and, and if we can define what you're trying to do um, in a way that lands it in that adjacent possible and win that market now, um, but know that you have a dotted line out to that spot out in the, you know, out in the not yet possible realm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that you're going to over time um, as, as, as the, you know, the, the, the possible sort of expands and moves outward over time, um, you're going to keep following the adjacent possible and, and, you know, introduce new things or new or, or new features or whatever it is that takes you there. Um, and so that's, it, it, you know, really, um, and, and that's where a lot of times the the um, head of product, the engineers in the room start to have um, a real field day with this conversation because they can see how that works. And, um, and then they'll, they'll help guide us to, you know, what is the, what is the right, where do you land the plane? So, you know, <laughs> it's the adjacent possible now and is a market you can win and actually build a business on. And um, and then take the world to that 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 vision that you have one step at a time. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So uh, when I, you know, I'm reading this book right now called Power Play, which is about Tesla's like a almost like a history or documentary book about uh, Tesla's um, start. And I see where they've done where they Elon did things very similar to that, where their main vision was to have an affordable electric car that anybody can own, but they knew they couldn't get there yet. There was no way to get there, you know quite yet but what they could do is build an expensive electric car and maybe dominate that market and use the funds that they're making for there to help them when the time comes where they could get cheaper batteries and they could make an affordable car is that kind of the idea that you're talking about there no it is it is um and um you know and by the way in tesla's case you know it was absolutely a, a category design story because the one thing that never existed in the world was an electric car that people actually wanted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> there had been electric cars, but they all kind of sucked. Um, and uh, um, and 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 um, Tesla's brilliance was to say, "Let's build an electric car that is literally the hottest car you could possibly buy." Um, and you know, yeah, it cost what it was. Mm -hmm. What it was introduced? What was it? One hundred fifty thousand uh, yeah, dollars? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I think it was started out at like one twenty, but you wouldn't yeah, get one right, for that. Right, right. <laughs> um, and uh, but you know, as a as a, I mean, as a category designer, I admire that 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 thinking greatly. Um, but you know, another class. I mean, a classic example of that was Netflix. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so, you know, you you know that Reed Hastings from day one, I mean, he named his company Netflix, for God's sake. He, you know that <laughs> from day one, he knew that eventually he was going to be showing movies over the internet. Right. Um, but first of all, it wouldn't have worked at the time that he that he created the company because we were dialing in over modems, most of us. And second of all, you know, people weren't just ready for it. Um, so, you know, he, he landed the plane um, in this space of ordering, you know, DVDs on on, uh, on the internet that would then show up in your mail and all, you know, that whole start for Netflix, mm -hmm. uh, with you know, with a, a a path that they would eventually take to get to where they are today, and um, it, you know, that's a, that's a, that I mean, that's just a classic example of uh, of a category design strategy based on the adjacent possible thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, and it's really cool to see companies like Netflix and see the, you know, where they started and where they are now, you know, go back to the fact that you're running DVDs, they're mailing them to you. And, and then the and then the challenges they got when they got to the point where it was possible, it was that adjacent possible. And they they tried to pull the trigger, but there was some blowback, you know, some pushback where people didn't want to pay for streaming, you know, at, at that point. And it wasn't good quality. It wasn't quite there yet but mm -hmm. then it did you know and and then now that's the, that's all they do you know that's their whole business model right right yeah yeah it's yeah it's a fascinating story so uh what are some companies that are out there today that are uh th that we should pay attention to maybe that, that, that are in that point that um you you can you know that you can see from a distance that they're they're going towards that vision and um it, you know it's still hit or miss but may maybe they're going to hit it yeah well um 
I, I mean, I, let's, I can, I can tell you about like a, a company we worked with recently. That's, um, you know, I think I can talk about them because they're very, they seem to be very proud of the work that um, we all did together. Um, so it's a, it's a company, company called Noodle, Noodle, Noodle dot, yeah. Noodle.ai. And um, so uh, when Noodle came to us, um, they, they were kind of hinging their, you know, their message of who they were on this phrase, enterprise AI. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and you know, I mean, if you say enterprise AI, in a way it sounds kind of cool, but on the other hand, um, it's like, well, what, what does it do? Uh, what, what problem does that solve? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of amorphous and, um, and, uh, but they, but they also had, uh, a, a, a lot of things around like um, this idea of they wanted to help create a world without waste. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they believe that, you know, AI and industry could help do this. Um, and so we, we sat around with them and we, we, um, you know, we really talked through like, you know, um, this whole problem conversation and, um, and, uh, you know, talk about, we landed on, on, on a problem everybody knows about and it's been around forever, but that never has had a solution, which is, and I'm gonna use the phrase we ended up came, coming up with, which is creating perfect flow from raw material to shelf. And so if you're a manufacturer, um, you know, what matters to you is, is everything from the raw material that comes in to placing it on a shelf somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there, there are, you know, through the supply chain, through the manufacturing process, through the distribution process, there are, you know, a million things that could go wrong um, and interrupt flow. Um, and every time you interrupt flow, you lose money because you either end up with, you know, um, empty shelves or you have product defects or, you know, something is, is messed up. Um, and um, there was, there was never... Uh, the technology was never quite possible to actually get enough data about everything from raw material to shelf and actually mix it with other data that's going to impact that, like weather reports or um, news about, you know, are there political upheavals in some country where you're sourcing material? Um, and, uh, and also mixing that with all the data coming from all your machines in the factory so you know what's running well and what's not and um, what products uh, are, are faulty and what, you know, raw materials are, are not working well um, and, you know, and all the way out to, you know, is the distribution system working right? Um, but now with all the data that we've got from all, you know, you know, iterative things, devices and sensors and, and, and you know, everything else that can come in um, and you can use AI to, to watch all of that and look for patterns and understand where, uh, where things could go wrong and make predictions and and say you know uh you know give you an alert that says you know if you, you get out ahead of this problem and it will um you'll be able to you know keep the flow going and um so um we they they, had, they ended up going up uh, out with uh, what they're trying to create is a category called flow operations mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's the idea of applying AI to solve this problem of understanding the complete path of a product, uh, with a, with a goal of um, creating perfect flow so that there's absolutely no waste, um, you know, it, along that entire, entire chain, and um, and so now like there's a, there's another company out there your readers probably their listeners are probably familiar with called C3 started by Tom Siebel. And um, and C three is all in on the on the enterprise AI type thing. And now enterprise AI seems the idea of what you know this, what Noodle hopes to be doing here is you know enterprise AI just seems like a tool that um, you know you're going to have to figure out how to use. Whereas if now Noodle comes into this game and says, "Here's a definitive problem that we can apply AI to solve," and here's what the world looks like. You know, a world without waste. Essentially, if we, if this, you know, once this actually works, um, and and they, they've had uh, a tremendous uh, success at, at you know getting attention, getting people to understand um, what it is they do. Uh, uh, you know, now that now that they've you know embraced that embraced that that vision and that mission. So um, and, and you know we, I mean, we believe in them 
you know, greatly. I mean, we, we, we think it's one of our, our most um, promising clients that we've worked with. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and certainly in this, you know, world that we live in now, if, if a company like Noodle can create a category of flow operations that helps every company waste almost nothing, um, you know, it's going to be good for, you know, climate change and the planet and everything else. So this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that we, we get excited about. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And, you know, we're at that point where a lot of scientists are saying, you know, we're almost at the tipping point of climate change. We need to do something now. So I think right. a product like that is, is awesome, especially that it's using AI to, you know, figure out things and to, to optimize things that, you know, are, we, we just don't have the manpower to do um, without it. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It seems like that could be a game changer for lots of companies and lots of industries out there, not just their own. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and so that's, and that's how this, that's how this, this sort of thinking works. Um, you know, thinking mm-hmm. about the, you know, thinking about the problem and then realizing what the solution is that you could build to solve it. And, and it, it turns out it can actually be a pretty powerful way to think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, do you have any other, um, I, I know you've written a book about uh, called Un- unscaled about AI before. Um, what, what are your thoughts on kind of where we're going with AI and is, is it something that, um, that every company is going to adopt eventually, or is it, or is it one of those things that, you know, it's going to be, it's going to stay specialized. Oh, well, I mean, I'm not the first person to say this. I mean, I mean, AI is, is the new electricity, Yeah. (laughs) you know, I mean, it's, it's just going to be, it's going to be in everything and it's going to be, you know, the, um, you know, almost mundane that it's there, um, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and powering everything that we do. And, uh, and, but you know the the book on scale was was um, about so a, a, AI is coming along at an interesting time um, because we're also in, there's there's this there's this amazing burst of invention that's happening um, you know like now uh, we traced it back to going back to you know mid two thousands around the time that um, that uh, the, you know that um, mobile t- mobile phones smartphones cloud computing. Um, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and big data and stuff like that started to come around. But then on top of that, um, we've, we've now, um, we're now inventing things like 3D printing and, um, and, and uh, genomics and, um, and, and, you know, and, and of course, AI is a big part of that, uh, a big, you know, big factor in all of this going on. But there's, so there's, there's this enormous burst of game changing technologies that's all happening within a 20, 30 year period. And the last time that happened, the last time there was anything quite this enormous at all at once was around, you know, 1890 to 1920, um, when, you know, we invented the airplane and the automobile and uh, the telephone and, and the world got electrified. Um, and, and so that burst of, of invention completely changed the way the world worked. Um, it created an entire new, new industries, um, you know, life, life at the beginning of that burst and life at the end of that burst were completely different. You think of life in 1890 versus life in the 1920s, you know, mm-hmm. entirely different. Um, and, uh, and we're going through that again now. And, um, and this burst of technology is going to similarly change every single industry um, on the planet. And, um, and 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 up in the way we live and that's what we're living through now in fact one of the reasons i think that this these times seem so tumultuous you know of course covert on top of all of that mm-hmm. I mean, interestingly enough you know the, the 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 last time we had a pandemic like this in 1918 came right in that middle of that burst also um but um but yeah, I mean, this, it's, this is all going to just completely change life as we know it. And one of the reasons that we feel it's so tumultuous is because that's what's happening yeah. underneath. And, uh, and so, um, you know, just, just look at, look at um, what's happening to, you know, uh, in, uh, as we're experiencing through COVID, the healthcare industry. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we thought that was sort of unchangeable in the, in the U.S. It was this, you know, sort of, kind of great but awful thing that we had in this in this country right i mean on the one hand you know amazing technology that could do all these things on the other hand it would you know bankrupt us and it was you know the dealing with it was just an awful experience um and uh um and, and now we're starting to use ai and apps and um to understand each individual's health and guide you to you know to take care of chronic conditions 
um, on your own rather than having to go to a doctor all the time or understand how to stay healthy, but you know, longer or stay out of the sick care system. Um, we've got apps that can actually help people with depression, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, stay stay well. Um, and and now COVID comes along and it brings all of this burst of you know we're all getting used to using. Uh, talking to a doctor on Zoom or on mm-hmm. a phone, um, and and getting you know getting healthcare um, virtually, and uh, so this you know this whole monolith of a of a healthcare industry is starting to break apart into these little pieces that um, all service better in a very specific way, a- and the way we it, by the time this is done, another given another d- decade or so, the way we all experience healthcare is going to be completely different than the way um, we you know we did. 10 years ago. And, yeah. and that's just going to happen to industry after industry. Yeah. It's awesome. I mean, I know like um, b- being at home and during lockdown, I have a, a 10, seven and three year old and my three year old got an ear infection. You, you kind of know it's an ear infection because you've had, you've had several of them. You kind of know the behavior and it was just awesome to be able to, you know, do a virtual appointment, jump on zoom with the doctor, the doctor diagnose it, call in prescription, get it delivered. And you're like, wow, you know, where was this, you know, a couple of years ago, this is awesome, you know, and, um, and it's unfortunate that we had to have a pandemic for some of these innovations to really take place and, and uh, get used, but it, it's amazing to see how kind of the human resilience has, has taken over in, in areas like this. Yeah. And, and you know, to, to just roll this back for a second to the adjacent possible conversation, mm-hmm. that shows you how important the, the human um, acceptance factor is in the adjacent possible too, because the technology to do that, um, it could have been, could have happened 10 years ago. Yeah. But we as a society, um, as users just weren't ready for it. Mm-hmm. And, um, so it, it took a big event like this to get the human side of it to come along. Um, and, you know, and then that's when it hit the adjacent possible and and this thing has just exploded. Yeah. Same thing with schools. I mean, like, you know, you, you, we had snow days, you know, it snows or what. Well, so being down here near Charlotte, you know, if it, if it rains really hard and might snow, they close schools, right? <laughs> <That's a> snow <laughs> day. <laughs> so we have a snow day, but now we don't have snow days anymore. Now we just, we're going to do a zoom day, you know, and we're going to do it virtually. I think they use Google meet or something like that, but we're going to do a virtual day. And, um, you know, because of COVID now, now people are more accepting to this and they understand it. And it's, it's a, a viable option so that you're not missing school. You can just do it, do it remotely. Yep. No, exactly. And, and, you know, and to the unscaled conversation again is, um, uh, so education, um, you know, you, you look at something uh, at these, um, some of these online course of Khan Academy or, um, so, uh, you know, some of the Udacity or whatever they're building online classes. And, um, and one of the things that that is starting to become a part of that is using AI um, to you know, understand how a particular student is interacting with courses so that it will, um, you know, know whether to, you know, go slower, go faster, bring in new material, go back and, you know, and, and, and go over something again um, and, and starts to actually tailor the education experience, the online education experience to that individual student. And, um, and so, uh, you know, now you think about what you just described as like, you know, people are getting more used to the idea of classes virtually. And, and there's no question that the way that we educate kids um, is about to go through some enormous change. And, you know, I don't, I don't think schools are going to suddenly close and every kid's going to just sit there and mm-hmm. burn a laptop all day. But some blend of that, of using using human teachers to do what they do best and using these um, AI-driven classes to um, do what they can do best is going to be a game changer in the way it gets the kids get educated. And um, I, I think that's something you're going to see really being thought through over the next decade too. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% right. I know I teach um, part-time at Winthrop University. And one of the things that, you know, we've always had um, our digital information design classes have always been in person. And then when COVID hit, it's like, hey, we're going virtual make it happen. Mm -hmm. And we had no problem. We had the tools, we had the technology, we knew how to do it. It was just one of those things we've never, we didn't have the human, you're right, you know, to to make that happen. And and since then, now, you know, coming out or well, maybe coming out, who knows with this Delta variant where we're at exactly, you know, they're going back and saying, hey, they're asking teachers, do you want to teach in the classroom? Or do you want this to be hybrid? Or do you want it to be, um, you know, online? How do you want the classes to happen instead of before it was always, you know, in the classroom? Mm -hmm. So it's really cool to see kind of that shift 
and um and, and where we're going and I, I just can't can't wait to see what's next yeah so, so i mean look at the um we're if if we're maybe a decade or so into this you know 30 year period of change i mean just it's going to be a wild ride <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure uh kevin man i really enjoyed this conversation i think it's been been great and um you know i can't wait to uh to read more of your stuff when <laughs> as new books come out yeah, no, I pretty well. So the um, your listeners can look for. Um, I, so I've had a Unscaled was written um, in collaboration with um, Hamad Tanasia, who's the head of General Catalyst, one of the big VC firms. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've now had a three book collaboration partnership. Uh, we did Unscaled. Then out of that, we did one called Unhealthcare, uh, which kind of blew out the healthcare chapter from Unscale because we thought that was so important. Um, and then literally just finished writing one about um, responsible innovation. Mm -hmm. And um, and and uh, similar to Play Bigger, the idea was to create a playbook like for founders of if you are, want to create a company that um, is, uh, you know, um, responsible innovation, stakeholder capitalism, conscious capitalism, whatever phrase you want to put on it, uh, how do you actually go about doing that? How do you think that through? What are the steps to take to ensure that you build a business model that um, that builds that in rather than something that you're going to, you know, this the second that there's some pressure on margins, you're going to reject. And uh, so that book comes out in January um, and uh, that that'll be the next one. Awesome. Yeah, maybe we can have you back on the show in January to talk about that once it's uh, it's released as well. That would be, that'd be uh, fun to do that. Let's do awesome. it. Well, well, thanks a lot, Kevin. Really appreciate having you on the show. And uh, we'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks, John. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also, don't forget to check out merch. We have some T-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geeklitter.com. Um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also, don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.